How can you learn effectively? We all probably have things that we're trying to learn, that we're trying to improve on, but what can we be doing? What can we be thinking about to make that learning as effective as possible? I'm a math professor, and so I've done a lot of learning of mathematics in my time, but I've now come to realize a lot of that learning was less effective than it could be. In this video, we're gonna look at some of my own tricks to study effectively, as well as some that come from cognitive psychology, from the study of how it is that people learn. So if you have something in your life that you want to learn, then, well, give this video a like, and let's learn how to learn. The first thing I wanna talk about sounds simple, but it's actually extremely important. It's the idea of a growth mindset. A growth mindset is the belief that you can genuinely improve on what it is that you're trying to do. This is in contrast to a fixed mindset where perhaps even just subconsciously you're acting in a way as if you can't make really meaningful improvements on whatever it is that you're trying to learn. For instance, suppose you're studying for a test. Somebody with a fixed mindset that isn't interested in developing their ability or doesn't think they can develop their ability in that particular field might just do a whole bunch of memorization because Memorization is sort of okay at getting some points on a test, and that's sufficient for them if they don't believe they're going to have long-term progress. Developing growth mindsets is actually a large part of reforms in education in this last decade. For instance, a new paper published in Nature last year looked at a large number of grade 9 students who were deliberately taught about growth mindsets. And what they found is that this actually improved their test scores, but more importantly, it improved it the most in classrooms or the sort of class culture where the peer norms, as the study refers to it, that those peer norms embraced that growth mindset, that were interested in trying to tackle challenging problems. And when that's the case, when you have that kind of mindset, you saw the largest improvements in test scores. Carol Dweck, who pioneered the concept of a growth mindset over 30 years ago, has a great little phrase that I like. It's just adding the word yet at the end of anything that might seem negative. For instance, instead of I can't do calculus, I can't do calculus yet, or I can't juggle four balls yet. That twist in your perspective will make changes to your behavior and make you more likely to be able to master calculus or juggling four balls. Unfortunately, in our society, we often have fixed mindsets, even if we don't recognize it explicitly. As I say, I'm a math professor, and when I tell people this, one of the most common reactions I get is people saying that they're bad at math, as if this is similar to just being tall or being short, something you can't really change. Now, I personally don't believe it's true. I believe that everybody is able to improve and to reason mathematically and even to enjoy mathematics. But when people have that kind of fixed mindset, it makes them less likely to engage in the behaviors that will allow them to improve their ability to reason mathematically. And it's not just negative fixed mindsets that have this problem. Positive ones, like I'm great at mathematics, also can inhibit your ability to develop. For example, if you think you're great at mathematics, maybe you're not going to invest the time to genuinely improve at mathematics. You're just saying, I'm good enough, I'll just do a bit of study before the test and get the grade that I want, instead of really taking the time to improve and go on a mathematical journey. So fixed mindsets, either positive or negative, can be detrimental, and I encourage you to just have a real growth mindset about whatever it is that you want to learn. The next buzzword I want to introduce to you is the idea of metacognition. Metacognition is when you're thinking about your own thinking, or you're thinking about your own learning and how effective that is. With metacognition, you're not just going and learning the subject you want to learn, you're also pausing, you're reflecting, and you're trying to think, am I learning this as effectively as I could be? What am I doing? What am I thinking about as I, for example, watch a video about mathematics? Is that the most effective way that I could do this? Am I developing? Have I self-assessed the improvements that I am or am not making? Where am I failing to make progress and should rededicate my efforts to? Sandra McGuire has been a leading voice on this idea of metacognition. She actually has two books, one for educators called Teach Students How to Learn and one for students called Teach Yourself How to Learn. 
And both of these focus on the idea of metacognition. And in fact, in the one for educators, she talks about her research where by giving interventions to college students to train them about metacognition, they were able to improve their test scores by a letter grade. So I would highly encourage you to engage in metacognitive reflection as you go about your learning. you're probably going to be faced with sticking points, concepts that are particularly challenging, ideas that you really need to wrestle with. And the easy approach is sort of shy away from those, but for effective learning, you really want to focus on those challenging pieces. So how can you break it down and, and deal with how to manage those really challenging concepts that you need to understand to be a master in whatever you're trying to study? Well, one technique that I really like is something called simplify and explain. The idea here is that a complicated concept that has multiple different parts and strange ideas, if you're able to think about it and iterate your understanding over and over, making it each time simpler and simpler and simpler until at the end it's just almost obvious, you've focused on simplifying so much that it's completely obvious, then I think that you'll find this concept to be much more deeply understood. And if in that simplifying process you get it down to a version where you can go to a friend, to a colleague, and to explain this challenging concept to them, that is really the proof of the test that you've taken this complicated idea and are now able to express it in terms that you've internalized, but you understand that you can explain to somebody else. Often when you're first wrestling with a challenging concept, you're really relying on the way that the expert has presented it to you in a video or in a book but you're not really taking ownership of it. And so there might be little pieces of notation or concepts that you don't fully understand that are just sort of part of the way it's presented. And so if you really try to take all of the sort of fancy components that come from the discipline and, and simplify them to this simple concept you can understand, then you explain it and now you really deeply understand it. Some of the ideas come from Richard Feynman's so-called Feynman technique. He's a famous physicist as well as a famous educator. He has a whole sort of sequence of techniques on how to improve. I'll leave some links down in the description. One of the most important things for learning is asking questions. Often in a class, it's sort of the reverse where the teacher gives homework questions to students and then students provide the answers. And that might be fine for assessment, but for learning of any field, you really want to be asking a lot of questions. These days, I make it a goal of myself that if I'm trying to read something or watch a video like this, I want to come up with a list of really good questions about that video or that thing that I'm reading. Questions that will lead me on new tangents, questions that will make me more deeply understand the concepts and find ways to incorporate it into my own life and my own learning. Questions form the sort of background for an investigative spirit where you're not just doing what someone else has told you, you're really trying to discover and to learn things yourself and the questions lead you down different pathways. So when I'm learning something, I don't measure the effectiveness of my learning by how many things I've quote unquote learned. I measure the effectiveness by the kinds of questions that I've generated. Are they deep and interesting questions or even just superficial ones to lead me on to a more interesting path? The last learning concept I want to talk about is about motivation. Motivation is often separated into intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is motivation that comes from yourself. You want to do this because you're interested in whatever it is that you're trying to learn. Well, extrinsic motivation is like you should do this for a grade or you should take this course because it's a prerequisite or even you're learning this subject because it will be useful as a tool for something else. That happens all the time in mathematics. People take mathematics because they're interested in physics or chemistry or biology. And that's great. But one of the things that studies have shown is that intrinsic motivation is a better motivator in many cases than extrinsic motivation. And people perform better when they have intrinsic motivation. Now, motivation is notoriously challenging for people to develop as an educator. It's Hard for me to create motivation in my students. A lot of motivation has to come from themselves. Specifically, when we talk about mathematics, one thing that people often say is they want to see real world applications. They want to see, well, how is it that what you're learning is going to apply? And I actually agree that that's an important thing. But 
I would also encourage you to try to find some joy and some excitement in the field intrinsically. For instance, in mathematics, I think there can be a lot of joy found, a lot of interest in seeing some of the delightful puzzles that mathematics has and the process of going through that to see some of the beauty that mathematics has and kind of sort of the excitement when you get to see some of these really cool theorems that happens in mathematics. And developing that intrinsic motivation is hard that even me saying this might be interpreted as sort of like a corny, okay, come on, math is beautiful, whatever, who cares? I'm doing this math for my, say, engineering course. But I think if you at least spend a little bit of time trying to appreciate the fields for it is and developing that intrinsic motivation, you're going to find yourself more motivated and more likely to take effective learning strategies. So I always like it if you have a lot of intrinsic motivation. I wanted to share one example from my own life of how I use these different learning strategies. Something I'm trying to learn that I've just been starting to get into is chess. So this is sort of a New Year's resolution, but how do I want to go through these different things we've talked about in this video to improve it? So the first thing was growth mindsets, and I believe that I do have a growth mindset. I think it's possible for me to meaningfully improve in my ability to do chess, not just sort of grind out playing and, and never really change my ability. I do admit that I have a bit of fixed mindsets. For example, I'm 34. It's less likely that I'm going to be a grandmaster than somebody who was starting when they were really young, but that isn't quite the right metric if you're trying to think about, can I really genuinely improve on a particular thing? And yes, I can. Metacognition is something I'm already incorporating in a lot. I don't just try to play chess and to study chess, but to take some time and think, well, what parts of my learning of chess are effective and what are not? So I really definitely think I've got the metacognitive piece nailed down. Chess is a great example of learning where the explain and simplify part is relevant because when you are learning a new chess concept, often it's explained through some sort of specific example where there's lots of details that are relevant to a specific game, but we're talking about a more general principle. And so the more you can sort of distill the principle and explain why that's the case, simplify it down to something that you can understand and explain, I think is gonna be really valuable. Also like generating questions. For example, if you watch a game by some experts and you can ask, well, why didn't they do this other thing? Or why did they do this? I can sort of see parts of it, but not all of it and, and try to generate large lanes of questions or even questions about your own games. Why did your opponent play in a particular way? Can you really understand the reasoning behind that? Or why even is just a general chess principle true or a useful heuristic in the first place? Can you explain that? I think these questions are all very useful. And then finally, intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. I think I've got that one okay. I don't have any extrinsic motivation for playing chess. It's just something I enjoy and want to do, so I have that one nailed. If you enjoyed this video, if you learned something about learning, then give this video a like. We have a lot of big things coming to this channel in 2020. It's going to be a big year for us, so hit the subscribe button, and we'll do some more learning in the next video.